Welcome to the Walter Gordon Symposium on Revisiting the Role of Academia in Public Policy. Um, my name is Margaret. I'm a junior fellow here at Massey College um, and a PhD student in higher education at the University of Toronto. Um, I'll be giving the land acknowledgement today. Um, Massey College is built on land where many Indigenous peoples have lived. It is on the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, as well as the traditional territories of the Huron-Wendat and the Haudenosaunee peoples. We want to acknowledge um, our duty of stewardship toward the land and the great privilege that we have to work on this land. Okay, thank you, Margie. Um, yeah, as she said, good morning and welcome to the Wal Walter Gordon Symposium. Uh, so the WGS is a vital platform um, for the interplay of academia and public policy. Um, we put public, public policy center stage and it's um, jointly kind of uh, endeavored by the Monk School and Massey. And I hope today's session um, is both enlightening and transformative for, for all the policy professionals in the audience. Um, in recent years, we've observed a discernible shift in public trust towards academic institutions. This phenomenon isn't just skepticism, um, it's a reflection of a broader societal challenge where the very essence of expertise and evidence-based insights seem uh, to be put on the back burner. Uh, at the heart of this symposium I is a crucial question. How can the academia um, or the academic institutions as sort of a bastion of knowledge and innovation uh, reclaim its pivotal role in shaping public discourse and policy in a world that's increasingly fraught with complexity, rapid change, and um, anti-intellectualism. So we're revisiting the role of academia and public policy um, because it couldn't be more timely. Uh, pressing global challenges from war to climate change, public health crises, all need the vital role of academia um, to provide grounded, evidence-based policies, and, and it's more accurate, um, acute than ever. Uh, the academic sort of uh, side of society poses a reservoir of critical analysis, innovative solutions, and importantly, long-term perspectives that transcend the immediacy of political cycles uh, and, and populist narratives. These are invaluable assets that can and should shape the policies that guide our society. Um, to me, at least, the, the role of academia is in this context is clear. First, uh, it must continue to push the boundaries of knowledge, conducting rigorous research that uncovers new insights about the world we live in, even if it's uncomfortable. But equally important is the academy's uh, responsibility to step up beyond uh, the quote-unquote ivory tower and engage directly with policymakers, community leaders, and meet the public where they are, not where we want them to be. This ensures the dissemination of scholarly research and, in, in my opinion, again, enriches public policy, uh, both in debates and, and in decisions. But this is not without its challenges. Um, engaging with the public, academics often face a daunting task of navigating public scrutiny, and the increasing politicization uh, of work. But within these challenges are, are tremendous opportunities. By stepping into the public policy arena, we as academics have the potential to make significant societal impacts, influence policies that are more informed, effective, and more importantly than ever, equitable. Uh, the academic insights can guide public discourse, helping to shape governance that truly serves the common good. So naturally, how do we bridge this gap? How can the academics engage more effectively with public policy? I think the answer lies in building stronger partnerships be between academia, policymakers, and the broader community. It's fundamentally about creating channels for dialogue and knowledge exchange ensuring that ac academic research is accessible, understandable, and actionable for those shaping and making policy decisions. Effective communication and outreach is key, as is the willingness of academic institutions to actively participate in public discourse. This brings the evidence-based insights that I keep um, pressing on to the forefront of policy debates. So as we delve into today's discussion, let's keep 
uh, that at the forefront, that we have immense value to add and the potential of academics um, to contribute to public policy. The challenges that we face in society and in Canada are complex, uh, but within them, there are fantastic opportunities for uh, academia to engage. By fostering a collaborative, engaged approach to public policy, um, academic expertise can once again become the central role in guiding our collective future towards a more informed, effective, effective and equitable form of governance. So before I hand it off to Margie, I, I invite all of you to engage deeply with today's discussions, to share your insights, and to explore how we can enhance uh, academia's role in public policy. To me, at least, this is more than just a symposium. I hope it is a starting point for meaningful collaborations and initiatives that can lead to tangible, impactful policies. Um, let's seize this opportunity to make a difference, and this is also your chance to ask um, Mel, uh, David, and, and, and Peter some really piercing questions. Thank you. So I'll be giving a brief overview of the different sessions that we're going to be having today. Um, so our theme is uh, revisiting the role of academia in public policy, as we mentioned. Um, and um, we'll be exploring the different insights uh, and how uh, research can tangibly impact uh, and shape public policy. Um, so we'll begin with our first session called Setting the Stakes, moder moderated by Junior Fellow Aditya, um, inviting Peter Lowen, Mel Cap, and David Wolf to discuss the critical questions and consequences of academic involvement in public policy. Um, this session aims to reveal the importance of academia's voice in public policy debates and decision-making processes, exploring the risks and rewards for academics who step into the public policy arena, discussing both the challenges and public of public scrutiny and the opportunities for substantial societal impact. Um, and then we'll pause for a 15 minute coffee break in the junior common room and then come right back here into the upper library for our second session called um, Academic Experiences. Um, and this session will be moderated by Satya Shiazdani, who is a junior fellow here at Massey College um, in conversation with George Fallis, Carolyn Tui, and Mina, Ta and Mina Tadros. Um, this session um, invites seasoned academics who have firsthand experiences engaging in public policy to share insights and strategies for bridging the gap between academic research and real world policy implementation. Um, and then we'll go for another break um, in uh, for lunch uh, for at uh, 12.30 to 2 p.m. Um, in the junior common room. Um, so please take this time as an opportunity to both refresh, but also to engage um, and learn from one another's perspectives. Uh, we have a great group of attendees here who can share insights and perspectives and experiences on the role of um, the academy in public policy. Um, and then at 2 p.m., we will be reconvening back here in the upper library we'll where a junior fellow, um, Allison, um, will be introducing our keynote speaker, um, Professor Glenn Jones. Uh, Professor Jones is a globally recognized scholar in the field of higher education and has been active uh, in the uh, discussions about the role of the academy in public policy. Um, his keynote address will be um, uh, exploring the evolving relationship between university faculty and public policy. Um, and then we will tr transition into our third session called Policymaker Perspectives, moderated by junior fellow Mina Zahin. Um, and she will be joined by Maurice Bitrin, Brian Lewis, senior fellow David Zimmer, and Anshu Kamal. Um, this panel explores the relationship between academic institutions um, and policy formulation, discussing the crucial role that academia plays in informing and, shape and shaping effective public policy. Um, this session will cover how academic research contributes to the development of evidence-based policies, the importance of fostering partnerships between scholars and policymakers, and the strategies for overcoming challenges and integrating academic expertise in practic into practical policy solutions. <laughs> and after a 15-minute break, we will reconvene here again for our last session in the upper library called Rapporteur Remarks with junior fellows Noah Khan, Alison DeCruz, Mina Zaheen, Satyash Nassani, and myself. Um, and in this session, we will offer our insights and reflections uh, from today's proceedings, um, highlighting the key takeaways, uh, emergent themes, and potential implications for future research and policy. 
Um, so each session is designed to build upon uh, the previous, offering a comprehensive look at how academia can influence and enhance public policy. Um, so we're excited uh, for the rich discussions and insights that these sessions will generate. Um, and before we begin, I would like to extend a heartfelt thank you to all of our speakers, organizers, and staff here at Massey. Your dedication and support are what make events like these possible. Um, so uh, to our speakers, your expertise and willingness to share your knowledge will greatly enrich our discussions, and your perspectives are crucial in exploring the dynamic relationship between academia and public policy. Um, and to our attendees, thank you very much for attending um, and being here, your willingness to dive into these discussions and for your insights that you will be bringing um, into our conversations today. Um, so today presents a unique opportunity for interdisciplinary dialogue and cross-sectoral collaboration. Um, so as we explore the intersections of academia and public policy, consider how you in your own work um, can bridge this gap. So whether you're a scholar or a policymaker or um, a student or a practitioner, uh, your involvement is crucial in ensuring that academic research continues to inform and shape effective public policy. Um, so I will pass it over to Aditya to um, start our first panel, setting the stage. Yes, of course. Um, now, David, Peter, please join me up here. So uh, thank you uh, for joining me on the panel. Uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to do a quick intro about the three of you to, to our guests. Uh, from my, my immediate left, we have Peter Lowen, who is the director of the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. He also teaches um, in the Department of Political Science and at the Monk School. Uh, Peter is also the director of uh, the Pearl Lab and an associate director of the Schwartz Reisman Institute, a senior fellow at Massey College, and a fellow with the Public Policy Forum. Um, between 2020 and 2022, he was a distinguished visitor at the Institute for Advanced Study at Tel Aviv University. And Professor Lowen has also published in Proceedings of National Academic, Academy, Ac Academy of Science, Nature Medicine, Nature Human Behavior, American, American Political Science Review, American Journal of Political Science, Journal of Politics, I cut that list down for short. <laughs> he has edited four books and is a regular contributor to the media, including New York Times, Washington Post, Globe and Mail, Toronto Star, and the National Post. Thank you for joining us today, Peter. Um, to the left of Peter, we have uh, David Wolf. David is a professor of political science at the University of Toronto and the University of Toronto, Mississauga, and uh, is the co-director of the Innovation Policy Lab at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. His research include the political economy of technological change and the role of uh, local and regional economic development with special reference to Canada and Ontario. From October uh, uh, 1990 to August 1993, he served as executive coordinator for the economic and labor policy in the cabinet office of the government of Ontario. And I can attest from personal experience at ISAD that David's um, opinions carry heavy, heavy weight uh, within Ottawa. Um, and to the left of David, we have Mel Cap, uh, who from 2006 to 2011 was the president of the Institute of Research on Public Policy. And prior to that, he, ser he served as Canada's High Commissioner to the UK for four years and previously served as a clerk to the Privy Council, um, Secretary to the Cabinet, and Head of the Public Service. Uh, earlier in his career, Cap held senior economic and policy positions with the, with the Department of Finance and Industry, Deputy Secretary to the Treasury Board, Deputy Minister of the Environment, uh, Deputy Minister of Human Resources uh, and Development, Deputy Minister of Labor and Chairman of Canada Employment Insurance Commission, and if I haven't mentioned already, was also the highest uh, public servant in the land, the Clerk to the Privy Council. Um, thank you all for joining me today. It's, it's really a pleasure to have you. Um, so perhaps I can open the floor up um, uh, to the four of you answering some general questions um, about public policy and, and your perspectives on it before I, I delve in a bit more deeply with tailored questions. Peter, would you like to start first? 
Sure, I'm, I'm happy to. I'm looking forward to, to the discussion and, and to the questions. I might just, to start, sort of put two things um, on the table. Um, one is that, um, and then and I'll, and I'll let uh, Mel and, and David respond to the propositions maybe, but one is that um, most evidence-based policy is not evidence-based. Um, uh, or doesn't consider all the evidence that we should we should we should care about, like people's preferences, what might work politically, um, what the likely responses are to something, how policy in one domain works um, with another. Which is all a way of saying that doing evidence-based policy is not as simple as we think it is. Um, it's more it's more complicated than simply following the advice of an academic. Um, and the second thing is is that um, universities are is a proposition are not designed to give public policy advice. That's not our principal mission. Um, it might be one of our social obligations and it might be what the public wants us to do, but the principal animators of universities, it's a long list, but it doesn't include informing public policy, for better or for worse. Um, and I think those two facts that we're not quite sure how to wrestle with evidence and the fact that universities are not purpose built for the, for the creation and the dissemination of evidence to policy makers um, is, uh, part of why we have to have panels like this and figure out exactly what we can what we can do. I'll, I'll leave it at that and turn it over to, to David. Um, <coughs> I think I should have gone before Peter um, because I'm, I'm going to disagree a teeny bit with him. Um, so I, I started um, my career uh, at the early stages um, doing a ton of work for the then Social Planning Council of Metropolitan Toronto, principally on labour market and uh, advanced education train, training issues. And as a result of that work, I got invited to participate in one of the Ontario Premier's Council reports in 1988-89 uh, for a good friend of mine, uh, working for someone who became a good friend of mine on uh, the report People and Skills in the, the New Global Economy. And a year later, there was a surprising election result in Ontario that no one, including the person who got elected premier, <laughs> expected. Um, and another fre colleague slash friend, someone who'd started their PhD at U of T at the same time I had, uh, ended up as deputy secretary to the cabinet and invited me to come work in the cabinet office, which I did for three years. Um, so that. I think I was still at a fairly junior stage in my career and I had a chance in that period to test a lot of the things I had done in the policy uh, respect. So I, I regard that as the applied learning part of my um, PhD education. A lot of what I thought I knew, I realized I didn't know. A lot of the way I thought that, you know, we, we, we were teaching in courses. Uh, I realized that we were like skimming the surface of what we would really need to know or s our students would need to know to work in, a, in the public service. Um, and I, uh, Peter's right, I, I, things that I thought were fairly straightforward and could be implemented relatively easily, um, I think I completely underestimated the capacity for them to go off the rails. And um, the key takeaway I had from that um, we had a colleague here at U of T for many years, Carolyn will remember, Everett Lindquist, who used to argue with us all the time that we focused too much on public policy and not nearly enough on public administration. Everett eventually decamped for another school where they focus more on public administration. But I, th but I think we, we underestimate um, the importance of the public administration and actually implementing. We can devise the most brilliant policies in the world, but they're not going to be worth a, th a thing if they're not implemented effectively. And I think we under, that that's one of the pitfalls, I think, of, acad of academics in public policies. We underestimate the importance of the implementation, implementation side. I'll leave it at that. Um, I'm going to disagree with uh, David uh, because he only disagreed a little bit with Peter. I'm going to disagree a lot with Peter, um, even though he's my boss. Um, I, uh, I think the university actually has an obligation here, and I highly recommend you listen to Merrick Gertler being interviewed by David Hurley on uh, the Hurley Burley podcast, where uh, the president of this university says there is an obligation or uh, a role uh, that the university can play. Uh, and he was particularly talking about policy in the city, uh, that David, you've done some work on, uh, but he, he meant it more broadly. In any case, 
I really don't disagree with either of them. Uh, I think there, there are big issues to be dealt with here. Um, I want to just put a couple on the table. The first is that there are a number of different ways. Uh, the, the means matter, and there's a number of different means for academics influencing or having a contribution uh, to public policy. And you know, we know, all know about op-eds. Uh, when, when in my class uh, at Monk, uh, we used to have, uh, or one year we put on uh, preparing an op-ed as an interim assignment. The students thought that an op-ed was uh, absolutely random thoughts that you could put on paper and just do a brain dump, uh, when in fact an op-ed is a very, very challenging um, policy analysis uh, to be done, and it has to be structured and it has to be done in 700 words. It's hard to do that. Uh, so I dropped the op-ed as the assignment, and now you do a briefing note to the minister. Um, but the op-ed is an, a classic example, but there's a whole range of others. Contracting, working as David did uh, in government, um, going in and out. Um, you mentioned Everett Lindquist. Uh, when Everett, uh, when, after he went to the University of Victoria, I. Uh, I was in the Treasury Board uh, Secretariat as Deputy Secretary and brought Everett uh, in for a year uh, to, he's the only academic I know who attended a cabinet committee meeting. Uh, he would come to the, to the uh, Treasury Board uh, meetings and see ministers in action. And that led to a deeper understanding he had for his scholarship. Um, and then, so he was able to take the practical and translate it into uh, the um, uh, the scholarly, and of course, he took the scholarly analysis he had done in public administration, as David said, and applied it to advice in uh, the Treasury Board. Um, the other thing I'd ask you to think about are the other uh, elements here. Royal commissions have played a very important role in Canadian public policy. And in particular, I can think of the McDonald Commission, which led to free trade, um, but the analytics that were done behind that in the background papers. In fact, we're here at the Walter Gordon Symposium. Walter Gordon chaired the Gordon Commission. I know that none of you remember that, maybe Tom. Uh, but uh, the Gordon Commission had fantastic background research done by scholars of great repute and renown that then input to, uh, to government policy thereafter. And Walter Gordon went on to become a uh, fin finance minister. So um, there are many different vehicles. Keep that in mind. Um, I I'll, I'll end this round by just a, a little anecdote. Uh, two people have sent me in the last two days um, a, a reference to an inter uh, a podcast by John Hartley uh, where he interviews Steve Levitt. Steve Levitt is the author of Freakonomics. He's a... a, a University of Chicago professor uh, in the business school. And he's giving up his academic uh, role. He's resigning from the university in order to be able to uh, have more influence on policy. And he bemoans, in, and he tells these wonderful little anecdotes like uh, Alan Kruger, the great Alan Kruger is an economist at Princeton who worked uh, in the Clinton government, uh, used to prepare a summary for Clinton uh, of academic research every week and had taken a Levitt piece and given it uh, and given it to Clinton and Clinton had marked it all up and um, and because it supported the policy that they were doing Levitt became the most read uh, graduate student <laughs> as he was then uh, because Janet Reno the um, Attorney General was handing out his paper to all of the uh, uh, Congress people and, um, and Levitt thought he was having an influence. And then he realized later in life that he was being used. <laughs> he was being used by the politicians because his research happened to support, but hadn't input to the creation of uh, the policy that the administration had taken. So there are a few pitfalls, and we'll come back to some of them. Okay, thank you. Um, Peter, I kind of want to give you a chance to to uh, retort to your colleagues here, uh, both of them disagreeing with you. Um, and, and perhaps in doing so, um, 
you, you could uh, answer one of my questions for you, which, um, you know, your research includes studies on political behavior and public opinion. Um, so if academia can contribute, how can they contribute to public policy that are both reflective and responsive to public sentiment, um, particularly in contentious areas that, that we seem to be in chronically now? So I'll just, uh, so I'm happy to speak to that, and I'll just, I'll just say that uh, I, I'm glad when Mel and David disagree, uh, but, but I'll just note that what I, I guess the contention is that, is not that universities have no role in public policy, but they're not built for that role. That, that, that the way we structure incentives for academics uh, over the course of their career rarely gives them opportunities to contribute to, to, to public policy. So you do get the rare academic, and David is rare in this sense, right, of being both a very, very good academic and being animated by things that are of, of current and public concern. So when the opportunity comes to contribute to public debate, he has knowledge right at the, right at the ready. Most academics, and, this, and, and I'm, not, I'm not, don't think here of someone who's doing you know, work on film noir in New York in the 1950s. Think of someone who's actually doing something that's close to policy relevance. There's nothing wrong with doing that, but someone who's close to policy what relevance. What about TIFF, sir? What about TIFF? <laughs> Clear public policy issue with dealing with film noir in New York. There we are. There we are. I thought you meant the I thought you meant the governor, um, but but thank you for clarifying. Um, but but it is but it is rare that you 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 have that person. So so instead, what you might have is someone like an economist uh, who's working away on uh, a labor economist who's working away on a question about. Um, I'll I'll give you an example uh, about um, the number of weeks out of work and how that affects EI uptake. Right. Actually, answering that question to the standard of the economics profession will take two years working on a single paper, wrestling to the ground, uh, thousands of megabytes of data, and then wrestling blindly with reviewers at a journal um, for months and months and writing 200-page appendices just to get that in. And all of that boils itself down to, frankly, to one policy intuition that could be summarized in a 700-word op-ed with 200 words to spare for a, for, a, for a policymaker. So the standards that that an academic has to get to to get things into top flight journals now versus the, the marginal impact of the insight that they're generating is completely unaligned. Mm -hmm. Now, at the same time, that academic, if they were put in front of a policymaker who was puzzling through how to optimize EI, could, in 15 minutes, give them better advice and better intuitions about how to wrestle with this than any person working in Ottawa today. And I don't mean that to be critical of people who work in Ottawa because our students go there and they're incredible and some of my best friends are public servants. But, but that person has thought very, very deeply about something and has mastered all the knowledge of it. They operate as an academic at the 1% at the of the 1% of the margin where they're trying to move that idea along. But they, see, they can see the whole of the moon in this case. So, so the difficulty here is that that person who has that incredibly deep reservoir of knowledge is incentivized in the academic system to focus on a very, very small sliver of it, right? And not to share the broadness of that knowledge with a policymaker. Now, that's not their fault. In some ways, that's a story about not only their incentives, but the incentives of public servants to not know who to reach out to to get these kind of um, insights, not even intuitions, insights that would help, help, help guide them. So it's not that, it's not in particular that the academic has bad intention or doesn't want to help with policy. If you ask them, they'd say, I'm working away on this paper because I think it really has important real-world implications. But they don't have the chance to recognize that the depth of their knowledge is what is actually the valuable thing to the public servant. And the public servant doesn't necessarily have the, have the network to reach, out, to reach out to them. That's ultimately a problem of, of, of incentives because I can tell you that when we review files for tenure and when we review files for, to promote someone to full professor, at the Monk School, which is a, you know, a place of applied impact, we definitely care about people's public relevance, but we can't send out for letters uh, and get someone over that bar unless other academics are saying, that little tiny slice of the moon that they were looking at, they've described perfectly. Um, so that's, 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 part of the, that's part of the challenge. I would say the second thing, though, is it, it, to, to, Mel's, to Mel's point, is that you know, at, at universities, we're, and th this will be perhaps more, more controversial, but um, it's very, very comfortable uh, in universities to remove oneself from the policy process and, and remove oneself from an obligation to make the world better and to instead to sit in a very critical posture about the world, right? And I think the public sometimes sees a massive disconnect 
between the problems they see in their real lives, the wonder of the world that we live in, and then how academics talk about this place that we, that we, where we are. Right? This is a pretty incredible world that has some serious problems that might be solvable. Um, but, but there is a disconnect between the way the public sees the world and the way we describe it. And that leads to a credibility gap between academics and, and the public and between academics and politicians. I know Mel wants to come in, so let's come back to the question of how you, whether public sentiment should matter for public yeah. policy, but, but Mel, uh, Mel had his finger up. Well, uh, no, I, I, I want to, I, unfortunately, I want to agree with you. Um, Thank you very much, Aditya. <laughs> the, 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 I, I just want to take your point about universities not being built for public policy. Uh, departments in government are not built for taking in academic input. Yes. Uh, and that's a problem. Uh, I mean, there is the Bank of Canada has a visiting scholar uh, every year, the Clifford Clark visiting uh, academic at the uh, Department of Finance, and now the Simon Reisman uh, scholar in residence at the Treasury Board Secretariat that Everett uh, was the first one in. Um, but they're, they're very rare. And uh, most departments, so the question is, where can an academic have a greater impact? In a department with a good policy shop? or a department without a policy shop. The marginal value of an academic's work should be higher where there isn't policy capacity in government, except it's the reverse. The only ones who know to ask the questions are the ones who have good policy Receptor shop. capacity. Yeah. yeah. David? Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't know where to go. Um, so in the innovation literature, there's a famous article from 1989 or 1990 on absorptive capacity in firms, right? The ability of firms to absorb um, university-based research and turn it into innovations. And so that's what Mel is talking about, and, uh, and I fully agree. Um, I think there's a more complicated problem, though, um, and I don't know um, quite how to, how to get to it. Um, there are a lot of really good middle-level people, most of whom, almost all of whom have been trained in university, almost all of whom have some public policy background or training, who are quite open and receptive mm -hmm. to academics. A lot of them reach out to academics, either the ones they, that train them or people they read in the field and, and you know, reach out to them. Um, but there is a very complex process about taking that research as refined or formulated by the middle level policy analysts in the government and pushing it up to the top of the system, right? And, it, and I have seen over and over and over again, and I've been involved on occasion with, um, you know, watching things get mangled and, and they don't end up the way they were originally pushed up the system. Um, and, and so we're back into where and how the public service is organized, how, how policy gets formulated from the middle levels up to the, the higher levels, how it gets uh, approved in the political process. And we're also in a world of um, paradigms. Um, I, 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 one of my uh, instructors uh, in my PhD was uh, Mel Watkins who worked very closely with Walter Gordon and would speak reverentially of Walter Gordon. And Mel used to say, you know, paradigms can be everything in policy formation. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the paradigms can, can strongly um, influence what external policy ideas get received and transmitted up and where and how they get filtered on their way up the system. Um, so I will tell you one, one of my favorite um, academics in policy stories. Um, I had the good fortune um, to get to know Fraser Mustard quite well in the late 80s and in the 1990s when he was running the uh, Canadian Institute for Advanced Research and um, Fraser was a true force of nature. Um, but he had recruited Richard Lipsy, who was Canada's foremost macroeconomist to run the economics and growth program in um, CIAR because he wanted, Fraser wanted to, he said he wanted to do for uh, macroeconomics what the population health program had done for thinking about health, right, which was his, his, his you know, home area and his favorite topic. Um, so Richard, to his credit, went off and um, basically spent two or three years retooling himself. 
um, and started reading Innovation Economics, which he had not read. If anyone wants to see the result of that, he published a huge, thick book in about 2004 with Kenneth Carlon, another student of his, on the results of all that thinking. But I heard him give a, a, a presentation on one of the first outputs of this research he'd been doing around 1989, early 1990, and he, he threw out a line in the middle of this presentation that I've never, ever been able to get out of my head when I think about academia and public policy. He, he said, I walk through the halls of the Bank of Canada and the Department of Finance, and I see row on row of economists sitting there, most of whom I know have been trained on my macroeconomics textbook, Lipsy and Steiner was the dominant textbook in the field for years, and I want to grab them by the collar and yank them and say, it's all wrong, and you need to come back for a retraining session. So, so um, academia cuts several different ways in the, in, in the public policy field, um, and I'll, I'll reveal some of my biases with this comment, but you know, some of what gets filtered into and accepted uh, into the, the policy sphere um, may not always be based on the most, re I, I won't say the best, but I'll say the most relevant academic <laughs> research. And I think, I, I think that's an issue um, right now uh, in the area of productivity. I think the biggest challenge in this country is the productivity challenge. We've been grappling with it for years. Uh, we don't understand it. My piece, my favorite piece on the subject is by Don Drummond. If you Google it, you'll probably find it, Confessions of a Productivity Junkie. Um, I highly recommend you read it. Uh, and uh, I think it's, it's a challenge because there are things we could be doing, but they're not the things that most of the academic experts and most of the policy experts tend to focus on. Mm -hmm. and, and so th th I'm trying to say, it, it, th yes, the policy is more complex, yes. but it's also riven by paradig paradigmatic perspectives that shape and uh, filter what gets accepted yes. into yes. the policy yes. process. Yes. And it's not always the things that will prove to be the most useful. Well, and how problems get framed and how we understand. Yeah, how yeah, problems get yeah, framed. Yeah, yeah. yeah, all the way down the line. Can I just uh, pick up on uh, references to Drummond and, uh, and Fraser Mustard? Uh, Don Drummond spent uh, 25 years in the government of Canada before he did any of the analysis that David's referring to, uh, which is interesting. And so he's advanced, uh, he's made the transition in, a typically, in an atypical uh, fashion. Um, the Fraser Must I was going to use Fraser Mustard as my example uh, because his research uh, prior to CIFAR and then at CIFAR uh, was about uh, early childhood development. And that led, uh, and, and the research was impeccable and it was really pathbreaking. And uh, he and Margaret McCain chaired a, a review of uh, the area. And when I was at uh, what was then HRDC, now ESDC, uh, social policy, um, the National Child Benefit was a, as a result, but now the Canadian Child Tax Benefit is a result of Fraser Mustard's work. And the only way we could get a federal provincial consensus to get, you know, Alberta and Saskatchewan on side was because of the research. That it became incontrovertible that giving money to uh, poor families was going to improve the outcomes of their children. Thank you. Um, David, I will come back to your point uh, about productivity a bit later, but um, Peter, I want to hold you to answering the second part of the question that I posed to you about <laughs> the dissonance that the public experiences and how academics speak about uh, issues and how it's uh, implemented into policy. Um, perhaps you could expand on that uh, and kind of explain should the public be communicated to a bit differently? Should they be a part of the process? Or should academics commit to, as you describe it, describing the slice of the moon perfectly? No, so, um, I mean, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna speak too much more about what academics get wrong in terms of the, the nature of the world, because I'll get myself in trouble. But, but, but w what I will say is this, is that, is that you know, we often think that politicians don't follow good policy because they're just following what the public wants them to do, right? But actually, 
politicians don't know the public that well. Um, they do in certain ways, but let me, let me just expand on this, on this point, because this is another avenue, actually, for academics to matter for public policy. I remember hearing a member of provincial parliament once, I won't tell you it was Frank Cleese, but it was um, the member from Oak Ridge's Moraine. I remember him saying, you know, the third largest language group in my riding is Russian speaking. And I thought, that, there's no way that's true. <laughs> and these data are readily available, and of course it wasn't true, right? It, it, it formed a very, there was a, there's a Russian community in, in that part of, Russian speaking community in that part of North, North of Toronto, but it just wasn't true. And I thought, how could he not know this, right? How could, like the census is readily available, it's actually, it's a bit hard to get the data, but, but, but nonetheless, right? And then you realize that politicians have, it always stuck with me, and politicians have all sorts of ideas about the people they represent which actually aren't constant with the empirical facts of who they represent. And I'll give you just two examples. There's a really growing literature which I've really been happy to contribute to about politicians' inaccurate reading of public opinion. So you might say, well, politicians are always just following public opinion, not policy advice. But they're systematically biased towards more conservative, of conservative opinions. They think the public wants them to do less than they do. Um, their, their, their misreading of public opinion is a function of projection of their own opinion onto, um, onto, uh, onto the public. Um, such, as, such to the point that the average politician, we have a paper in the, in the Journal of Politics just came out, four countries. The average politician across those four countries only knows what side of a, an issue the majority is on, like 60% of the time. So they're better than a coin flip 10% of the time. So, you know, this notion that, well, because for policymakers will say, well, they're just following public sentiment or they're just doing what the public wants and the public is short-termist, et cetera, et cetera. No, in many cases, they don't know what the public wants. And they also just don't know who their publics are. So, and this, this, is, this is a deeply important point. If you're trying to understand, if you're a politician, what is best for your constituency, and you crack open the Canadian census to figure out who lives in your constituency, on average, the data in that census are five years old, on average, because we do a census every, every 10 years, right? But if you were trying to make policy around transit policy or around, or around income supports, um, and you were trying to do it two years ago, you were working on data that were eight or nine years old. If you remember in Brampton, the population of your constituency grew by 40% over that time, and it changed dramatically over that, over that course in time. So all this is a long wind up of saying that actually politicians and policymakers as well actually lack as rich a picture as they could have about the people they're representing. Now they bring something else to the table, and, and I, I really want to value here what politicians do. They go into diners, and they go into restaurants, and they go into community events, and they get a texture for their community that's impossible to pull out of data. And their radar for what issues are really gonna matter and resonate is very, very good. But there's a whole number of things about their world that they live in that we could do a better job of describing for them. That part of the evidence we could give them is actually about the people that they're representing. How many of those people are actually struggling to buy a home? How many are struggling with, uh, with food insecurity? The numbers might be higher or lower than they think, but and how many are at the intersection of those two things, et cetera, et cetera. So there's all sorts of um, things about reflecting what the public wants and who the public is to, acad uh, to public policymakers that academics could do uh, a lot better of a job of. And I'll just venture to say that when it comes to understanding the objectives of a the objective facts of communities and the texture of them, it's probably the case that a politician in Lloyd Minster, Saskatchewan, has a better sense of their community than a director general sitting in Ottawa. That's, I'm gonna make that bold, that bold claim. So if they're not good at it, at really knowing what these folks want, then, then policymakers won't be, good at it, um, won't be good at it either. So that's a very important part. And that fits to David's point about paradigmatic ideas, right? About the overarching sense of how things go together. Because if we think the public looks like something that it doesn't, then you're gonna have the wrong policies. If you have the wrong sense of what the public's prioritizing and what they want their policymakers to do, what their concerns are, you know, what, what things are animating them in their lives, then you're not gonna put policy in front of them that they, that they want. And that should be at least part of what we wanna do in public policy. So a major role for the academy is, is not only in imagining new worlds, and, but it's actually re reflecting to politicians and policymakers with as much accuracy as possible who the public are and what that public uh, wants. I'm not saying politicians have to follow that, but they should know as accurately as possible what their publics want them to do and who their publics um, are. Yeah. Um, uh, Mel, perhaps you want to expand on that. Um, when, during your time at the Clerk's Privy Council, did you feel um, as though the, 
the big changes that, that, that whatever politician was, was kind of proposing was reflective of, of the public's needs and how did the public service respond to that? Um, I think I'll, I'll agree with Peter. Again, he's my boss. Uh, but the, 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 each of the groups, the public service uh, and the political level, bring the political actors bring different things to the table. And, and you need both or, or a multitude of different inputs in order to come up with good public policy. So do lobbyists, so do uh, NGOs, advocates, etc. Uh, many of our graduates uh, from Monk go into uh, work in NGOs and do good analytic work that ultimately ends up in good public policy or sometimes less than good. Uh, but uh, the public service can do the analytics that pe Peter is talking about on the data, um, and, but the the I w I always gave those MPs more credit, uh, which Peter has now burst my balloon on, uh, that they they had knocked on doors. I sat back and read the newspaper and and ran the numbers, but these guys knocked on doors and went to the diners and the barbecues, and that that was a huge input to their preoccupation of what was an issue worth uh, dealing with. B back to Fraser Mustard, uh, one of the great things he did, well, uh, he and Martha Friendly, uh, put early childhood education on the policy agenda. And public servants can't do that. Uh, they can tell ministers this is a fundamentally important issue, but if they aren't hearing it from those barbecues and diners, they're not going to feel that it's a, a really fundamental issue. Uh, so I think that you, you have to look at what the political level brings and what the public service can do, partly throwing cold water on what the politicians presume is what is driving. Mm, interesting. Um, I, I want to bring it back to, to David. So David, you've had various tenures with, with the government, three years full-time, two years part-time. What are some of the challenges that you've faced as an academic uh, in public policy? Um, and how can they perhaps be at least uh, alleviated or tried to be alleviated? Uh, <coughs> so, uh, oh, the, you got to really open the kimono on this yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, I, I I didn't promise to be uh, easy. To be nice, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, no, no. I, I there's just there's several different ways of coming at it, and there's something else going on in the back of my head, but I'll save it for another question. Yeah. Um, so I think <coughs> one of the challenges I had was um, uh, coming in with some colleagues who worked for the Minister of Finance. I worked in cabinet office. Um, we had a lot of scope initially to define policy uh, because the government, um, the party who got elected as the government had been talking about certain things uh, for decades but had, didn't really have a concrete idea of how they, want, how they wanted to implement it. So the one that I got to work on was industrial strategy. So the party had had a plank in its platform forever saying, you know, we need an industrial strategy for Ontario. Um, it was one of the first cabinet minutes that came out of an initial meeting, said, oh yeah, and by the way, tell somebody to start working on the industrial strategy. And that landed up on my desk and I got to work on it. Um, with some very bright and talented uh, public servants, Judith Wolfson originally um, at the Ministry of... Um, Went on to be a vice president of the University of Toronto and, um, and someone who I'd known since an undergraduate, Peter Sadler-Brown. Um, we spent two, two and a half years working on these things. In the end, we could never call it an industrial strategy because politically that was felt to be too sensitive so I think w or even an industrial policy we ended up calling it an industrial policy framework so that uh, was framework takes the air out of the yeah fr framework <laughs> took all the air out of the, the so that was um, quite uh, rewarding in many ways because because we did some very very good work Peter really led the charge over the last year year and a half of putting that together but, but we produced a, an interesting approach and then I had the opportunity to actually create a, a, a policy, a program called the Sector Partnership Fund, <laughs> which we, we implemented. Um, but then I learned one of the hardest lessons of academics going into policy, but for policymakers. We have a tendency in this country, governments change periodically, 
and this was the period where governments were changing quite regularly in Ontario, starting in 1985. And um, every aspect of this policy that we had put in place between 1990 and 1995 was wiped out with the stroke of a pen in the economic policy statement of Ernie Eves in July of 1995. So I learned a very hard, painful lesson. Mm -hmm. you, th you can think you're the most brilliant academic in the world. You can have the year of the premier and ministers. You can have really good public servants that you're working with. You can do collectively what you think is a great policy job, <laughs> and then it's gone, you know, uh, you know, as a result of an election. So never underestimate, you know, the impact that elections have on yeah. anything that academics or public servants do. That that was one lesson. Um, on another policy we worked on, um, that one went, went way off the rails. I've written about, published an article on how and why it went off the rails in Ontario Labor Market and Training Board. Um, the really interesting thing is it's, it is challenging to do this well. In, in, from 1989 to 1995, we established a federal labor market board, the Canadian Labor Market and Develop Board. We established 10 provincial labor market boards. Every board in the, every province in the country created a labor market board. And in Ontario, we established whatever the, cat, the number of colleges are. They were linked to the catchment areas of the community colleges, besides 22 or 24. I always get the number mixed up. But we established 22 or 24 local labor market boards. It, it was probably the, the most massive comprehensive redesign of labor market training policy in the history of this country, at least since I've been paying attention to it. And it was all gone by 2000 to 2005. It wasn't the, the Canadian Labor Force Development Board was gone. Every single one of the provincial labor force boards was gone. And if you search around Ontario, you can find organizations that are the remnants of those local labor force mm -hmm. development boards. So it is really, so those are some of the, the hard, painful lessons that I learned. We, we can, you know, bring good ideas. We can find a receptive policy capacity working with really bright, good uh, public servants who are open to the ideas. They, you know, they don't get implemented exactly the way we think or want them to be, but that doesn't guarantee in any way that they have a lasting effect. And I think that was probably uh, the hardest, um, the most important, and the most painful lesson that I learned out of that experience. Thank you, David. Mel, uh, you wanted to comment? Um, just quickly, uh, two uh, quick stories. Uh, in my time in Ottawa, um, if you were dealing with a science issue, uh, Peter Adams, who was uh, an MP from... Uh, Peterborough. Uh, the Peterborough, uh, and he, he was a glaciologist. And if you ended up testifying in front of a committee that he was on, he was going to rip you apart. Uh, and you better do your homework yes, uh, beforehand. <laughs> and, and he was just the nicest guy. I mean, he wasn't malicious in any way, uh, but he knew his stuff. And so the po politicians in this mm -hmm. matter. And uh, I don't know, David, if it was in the Ray government that you were there, but um, I ended up uh, the principal negotiator in the Charlottetown uh, uh, constitutional negotiations for the division of powers. And across the table from me, the Ontario representative was the then Deputy Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs, David Cameron, who went on to be Dean of the uh, Faculty of Arts and Science at this university uh, and is still a professor of uh, political science. Uh, and David, so why did Bob Ray, the Premier of Ontario, hire David Cameron and bring him in from the university to play a role in intergovernmental affairs because he knew that he needed smart people to do it and uh, uh, validate, valorized uh, uh, the academic perspective. And uh, David was probably the hardest negotiator I had to deal with around the table because everyone else were a bunch of bureaucrats, as I was. Uh, I say that with great reverence. Uh, but the point was that David brought a different perspective. Uh, and Bob Ray, I've just mentioned, now ambassador at the United Nations uh, and a senior fellow at, uh, at the uh, Monk School, um, uh, had an appreciation. He himself, a Rhodes Scholar with a PhD from Oxford, had an appreciation of the value of academics. So there's a proposition in that, right, which is that 
I don't know if this is true or not, right? But it's that um, it's that when when the country has tried to deal with higher stakes things, and commissions are often, as you said earlier on, Mel, are important, and commissions are often the creature of, of high stakes where we can't quite manage the politics of them. So we we, yep. we have a commission because it can do a lot of the work outside of the glare of politics. Through Meech, you know, through times of really serious economic turmoil like we were facing in the 1990s, there is more engagement with 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 academics. That's that's a proposition. I don't know if it's true, but 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 if it is, it speaks to the value of it speaks to the value of of of, of academics, right? To just just to David's point, I mean, can you imagine um, if you are one of the 99% uh, of economists who's been advocating for a carbon tax for the last 20 years as a way of dealing with 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 climate? Uh, uh, and all of that is undone by one political decision to cave into one premier, right? And you just see it coming apart at the seams, you know? Okay, so that yeah. was the thing, that was the conversation I was having in the back of my head, Drew, Peter. You've opened the can of worms, all right? <laughs> uh, so there is uh, a debate in the policy literature on, you know, sustain what, what now is getting called net zero growth or sustainability yes. transitions. And there are, Ah. <laughs> there are two ways of two ways of looking at the problem. One is through demand, the other is through supply. And on the demand side, um, the carbon tax is the most widely accepted, but I think it's turning into the classic case of what you were talking about, Peter, of politicians not fully understanding the public perception of the carbon tax. But on the policy side, there's also a raging debate among the, that other 1% of the economists and innovation scholars about whether in fact a demand side tool is the most effective way to shift mm. carbon consumption because it is an extremely blunt tool. Um, and it, it suffers from two problems. One is a distributive problem, yeah. like it, it's, it's a, any kind of sales tax, it, it impacts people um, unevenly. Um, so the government, in implementing the carbon tax, tried to compensate for that by I implementing a rebate, yeah. but you don't see the rebate till you get your tax return and, your, and, and the amount of the rebate. You don't link them up in your head. And, yeah. You don't link them up in your head. So there's a huge perception problem of the tax you're paying at the gas pump or on your home heating bo bill and the rebate you're eventually getting in your tax return. Um, so that's a real problem. But the other problem that's getting almost no debate in this country, except from a really small academic community, is, is that carbon, you know, some of the biggest carbon generating sectors of the economy are agriculture, steel, and the worst one by far is concrete, right? If we can't figure out how to produce concrete free carbon, we can do Every, uh, carbon free concrete, sorry. We can do everything else governments are trying to do and, and we'll never get to the, the, you know, the net zero or the 1.5 uh, degree increase change. So the question then becomes, what's the range of policy instruments that we need in order to effectively <laughs> reduce carbon uh, production in agriculture, in steel making, um, in concrete production? And that's a very different set of policy tools. Those are sectors that are not going to get transformed merely by, um, you know, a, a flat demand side tax like the carbon tax. And that debate is taking place in very, very small pockets of academics. Um, there is one fascinating body at Environment and Climate Change Canada, the Net Zero Advisory Board, which is doing really amazing work. Um, one of my former postdocs is there and one of my former PhDs has been doing some work for them. Um, but, but it's a really small corner of Environment and Climate Change Canada. It's not at all clear to me that they're having a major impact on policy. Um, but the debate is not taking place anywhere outside of this really small circle of academics. So, so to me, that's a classic case of, of they're not being the absorptive capacity in the public sector to really look at the issue from another perspective. And it's, and it's a classic case of what you're talking about, Peter, of, uh, of the, both the politicians and the policy makers. Like I know a lot of the academics who've been pushing the carbon tax, right? A and I've read some of that literature and it, it's, it's powerful academic results. It's, 
very convincing, but in some ways, but, I, but, but to me it's always ignored the supply side issue and the need to innovate on the supply side. Yeah, and, and it gets to the point that, that the debate at the political level is not actually one about evidence. Right, because it's because it's because we've yeah. the government has decided that the carbon tax is the instrument they want to use. They have evidence for that, right? But but the but the political counter to it is not. Well, hold on, there's there's this other. I mean, no one's standing up in, in in question period and saying, "Have you read this paper, Prime Minister?" <laughs> right? Uh, instead, they're they're arguing about the merits of the, the political merits of this thing or what it's going to do, what's how the impact it's having on citizens. And it's not an argument over the comparative weight of academic evidence. It's an argument now over whether the tax is acceptable. So the frame gets very narrow to begin with. The government sets a policy, and then that policy might be evidence-based, but then it's a political debate about that, about that issue from there on, right? And where does that, where do those, in what space do those new ideas enter? There, there, there is none for them. I, I, uh, full disclosure, I'm on the board of the Canadian Climate Institute, which is the sister organization to the Net Zero Advisory Board. Um, we have a better acronym, CCI, theirs is NZAB. Uh, but the, the point is uh, uh, that uh, there, there is a lot of evidence, and uh, one of the advantages, I'm, I'm going to come back to Everett Lindquist, the, the, the admi public administration issues are fundamentally important here. And if the government hasn't been able to explain that attached to the carbon tax is the rebate, then the government hasn't done its job. Communications is an instrument of government policy and has been totally ignored in the case of the, what was called the, um, uh, the Climate Action initi uh, in, uh, Initiative. Uh, and you get it on your taxes. And I, rem I always ask my class, when do you think it's going to kick in? And they always say 2025, 2026. And it's been there since 2017. So uh, that you know, nobody knows, uh, and that, and so, cutting out the carbon tax on heating oil, in, which is an Atlantic Canada demand, and Trudeau gave him that, uh, actually makes eighty percent of Atlantic Canadians Canadians worse off. Anyway, I, you know, I kind of want to uh, build on what you said, Mel, about communication and storytelling being an important tool of. Um, of government, but I want to build on it in a different lens. So, as a Master of Global Affairs student, um, one of the things that I pay attention to is foreign policy. Um, in my opinion, I feel as though, despite all the conferences that we've had at Monk, despite all the, the press publications, this government has not articulated a compelling um, and perhaps uh, forceful foreign policy. Um, what is the role of academics in this sense? How can they inform this? And Peter, I see you're smiling, and, and perhaps you have some choice words to add. Um, but uh, you know, you've also been the commissioner to the to the UK. So I, I'd like to know um, where do we need to see a shift? Um, yeah, if I knew the answer, I would sell it. I wouldn't tell you. <laughs> um, uh, but Aditya, the, it's a good question. I I think um, uh, you know the last time we had a foreign policy statement in Canada was 2005. Think about that. 19 years ago, we had a statement on public policy and foreign policy, and nothing since. Does that make any sense? Now, who held the pen on the creation of that uh, foreign policy? It was Jennifer Welsh, who at the time was a Canadian Métis uh, studying, or not studying, sorry, teaching at Oxford, and Jennifer then, I think she's now at uh, McGill, but, um, but she was the one they, that Paul Martin went to to say, I need your help in writing a practical, and that he came up, uh, she came up with uh, D-cubed, uh, and it was diplomacy, development, and defense. And uh, that was the organizing principle of uh, that foreign policy. But we've gone 19 years without an update. It makes no sense whatsoever. And I'm quite sure, Peter, that at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy, we have a couple of people who could probably do it in an afternoon. Yes, yeah, definitely. Uh, no, well, so, so foreign policy is a, a very interesting one because there's no evidence in it, I mean, it, 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 in the same way, right? I mean, what's the, I mean, there, there are things if you start talking about 
where we're going to fit in the resource market and and there's economic assumptions and things built in but it is it is it is as close to paradigmatic as it gets right you've got to have a set of beliefs about where the world's going how states interact with each other um, you know what the role of a medium-sized state is there's a whole bunch of assumptions that you have to put into that which are which are constructed and then from there you can come up with an idea about how you're going how you're going to operate so it's really heady stuff is a way, and it, and it, and it, it's as it's as intellectual as doing microeconomics, but it's a different frame of mind um, in some sense. I'm I'm smiling because um, I did two things yesterday. We had a session at the at the Canadian Embassy with a bunch of people from energy industries. There's more than one industry um, about what Canadian energy markets and things look like uh, if if Trump wins again in November. It was very very interesting, and we learned there. You know, we talked there about the. China right now is basically bottoming out the price of nickel, mm -hmm. right, by through Indonesian mines and flooding the market. And it's essentially, it's a play against the Australian um, resource sector. Matters for us too, right, because we have all the nickel in North America and the price is, price is, is caving um, quite, quite substantially. Um, and then I had uh, occasion to have I had lunch with the uh, Australian ambassador to the United States, who's Kevin Rudd, a former prime minister. And we were talking about how right now the Australians are working on a policy to come up with a new classification of battery-ready nickel that they think they can have designated on the New York Stock Exchange and the ASX, the Australian Stock Exchange, as a way of differentiating quality and then having a higher price for this stuff. So TSX is not present on this. When I asked him, you know, where is Canada on this, he said, you guys are great at hosting, uh, he didn't mean monk, he meant Canada. You guys are great <laughs> at hosting seminars about, <laughs> about foreign policy, but, you know, we just like to go out and do it. Uh, and then he said, you know, don't worry, you'll be, you'll be bolted on to whatever we do. Um, now that that's you know, Kevin's Mr. Rudd's a relatively uh, impolitic person when when talking about things like that. But the point is that more than that is that is that um, not a dissimilar country, but one that's taken its foreign policy actions I think a bit more a bit more and obligations a bit more seriously. Mm -hmm. Is that because they use less evidence or something? I, I don't think so, right? But I think it's that they understand the stakes are slightly higher. Uh, so I don't do foreign policy, um, but. Uh, I would argue that in Canada, probably the most important foreign policy we have is trade policy. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I want to come back to what Mel said earlier about the McDonald Royal Commission, because we had, uh, I don't think I have all 75 or 76 volumes of the research sitting in my office, uh, but I have a substantial number of them. Um, but on the free trade, uh, I mean, again, a wealth of uh, academic research. Um, two anecdotes from the, the free trade debate. Um, so Richard Harris and Cox had done a study for the Ontario Economic Council in 1979, which if you read the section of volume two of the McDonald Royal Commission, justifying free trade, um, was uh, the one that got cited the most. I think they'd done a follow-on study to that for McDonald. Um, the political science uh, side under Andre Blair and others had done a huge swath of studies on industrial policy. If you read the section of the McDonald Commission, um, they dismissed that whole part of the research in one, literally one sentence, Mel. There's one sentence in the report where they dismiss all the work by the political scientists on industrial policy. So yeah, you can have a great research program, but it doesn't get uh, into it. And one of our PhD students, Stephen Clarkson's PhD students, wrote a fabulous book, um, uh, Inwood, Greg Inwood, um, on the process. So I highly recommend it to you. Um, but the piece that I always thought was probably the most important and totally ignored piece was uh, a monograph by Richard Harris from Simon Fraser at the time called Trade, I always get the title mixed up, Trade, uh, Industrial Organization and Industrial Policy, something like that, International Competition and Industrial Policy, <laughs> where he argued you couldn't implement free trade without an industrial policy in, in a small open trading economy like Canada. And again, the McDonald Commission dealt with the Harris study in one sentence where they said, you know, Professor Harris has argued this, but we're worried it would have significant consequences for um, industrial, for competition, for monopolies in Canada. And they dismissed the whole study in one sentence again. So it is uh, really, really, uh, 
it, it's hard, so it, it's that paradigmatic problem, right? Where, where, where if you're writing, if you've got really talented academics writing really good analysis from a perspective that doesn't fit into the dominant paradigm, and the dominant paradigm of the free trade agreement, uh, of the McDonald Commission was the free trade agreement. So, so that's one problem. The other story, though, this is an, from an American academic, very influential in policy, not a Canadian academic. Um, so we negotiated the U.S.-Canada-Mexico free trade agreement uh, when Trump, at the beginning of the Trump administration. And Minister Freeland and the auto industry spent an enormous amount of time and energy in Washington getting protections into the USMCA for um, the auto sector, which was hugely important. Uh, we had a year or two before that rejected the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, right? Because it had all this language around trips and intellectual property that Canadians weren't comfortable with. Jim Balsillie spent a huge amount of time ripping it to shreds. So we had a seminar at Monk four or five years ago with Peter Cowie, a really good international relations scholar from San Diego who's done some work with uh, Dan Bresnitz in the past. Uh, and Peter had worked uh, for the Obama administration on the TPP, particularly on the IPP and the TRIP section. And he told us a story about academics and policy. Mm -hmm. So they had written that section of the TPP uh, to you know, advance the interests of American firms and technology-based firms and protect American IP in, in international trade. And he said, when the USMCA was being negotiated, there was nobody in Robert Lighthouser's staff under the Trump administration who knew uh, anything about all of this. So when they got to writing that section of the agreement, they literally took everything that had been in the TPP chapter and lifted it out it whole hog and copied it into the USMCA. And the Canadian trade negotiators, he said, who had been fighting tooth and nail against the TPP because of that section, we're so focused on autos that we didn't pay any attention at all to, uh, or didn't raise any objections to it being incorporated into the USMCA. So uh, to me, that's an example, you know, did we not have the right people in the room? Did we not have Canadian academ enough Canadian academics focusing on intellectual property and trips uh, to really be guarding against that? Did the minister not have you know, people on her policy staff who'd spend enough. I don't, I, that, that's a research project that, you know, we need a, P, a really good PhD <laughs> student or a Monk MGA student to take on, because to me, that, that's just a classic case of us being asleep at the switch and the Americans being way sharper and way more on the ball than we were. But, but, but the academics had a huge impact on that. Uh, interesting, so I, I wanna shift gears a little bit and, and um, sort of cater to our audience. I see a few Monk students, uh, MGA1, MGA2, and MPPs. Um, so all three of you are, are instructors at the Monk School, if not directors of labs, um, or perhaps both. I wanna know how um, policy-oriented programs can better prepare students and budding academics to contribute to, to public policy, um, whether it's debates or implementations or, or, or conjuring it up entirely. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a straw man you can shoot at, um, or to mix a metaphor. I, um, I, I don't know the answer to that, Aditya. My, my uh, impression is we do a pretty good job now. Um, I think we may undervalue communications. And I think that, um, I, I gave you my anecdote about op-eds, um, uh, explaining to our our students the importance of oral and uh, presentation and uh, written communications I think is uh, is really undervalued and I see this when I mark papers uh, or when my students do presentations in class uh, and I I give way more feedback than I want to uh, because I think it's valuable for them uh, but I'm not sure I mean, I'm not suggesting we have a class in English in the, in the program, uh, but uh, uh, emphasizing presentation skills 
and general communication skills, I think, is something we could benefit from. David, Peter? Um, so I, I think we do, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I was, I've got affiliations with both programs, MPP and MGA. I'm a little more familiar with what we're doing in the MGA program. I think the challenge, in, and I've taught in the MGA, I think the challenge is um, blending the academic academic literature with the applied policy side and finding um, the right mix um, in the area that I do the most work on, innovation policy, local and regional economic development. Um, it is hugely valuable to, you know, either give students an assignment or let them come to an assignment where they're dealing with an applied policy issue and, and take um, what I find uh, students that I work with in those kinds of programs or other ones in Mississauga, um, do is take uh, an applied policy area and then try to bring the academic literature or the comparative politics, comparative public policy literature to bear <coughs> on the issue. Um, it's not never gonna be the same as working in the public service and getting your hands dirty, but I think it's a reasonably good preparation. I do quite like what Mel mentioned at near the beginning of the session, uh, about giving them the assignment of writing a briefing note. Um, that was probably the first thing I had to learn when I went to work in the government, never having written a briefing note. And I'd say the first month or two months was an education in, in how do you write a two-page briefing note. Um, and uh, I think that's a very useful and important discipline. The other thing, though, that I think we do in these programs that's hugely valuable is internships. Now, not all the internships are with government, but uh, we have internships with uh, local governments. We have internships with, with, with private sector NGOs um, who are interested in influencing policy. So the internships, in my experience, are hugely valuable, plus capstone courses. Capstone courses are another valuable. So I think there, there are a lot of ways in those programs that we give our students, you know, really practical um, hands-on experience. J yeah. Just a quick point before Peter uh, disagrees with us. The, um, <laughs> uh, the, uh, I, I'm a professor of practice. I am not a scholar or an academic uh, and don't purport to be. I have an academic interest. Um, I hear from a lot of people that we should make our program more practical. And I want to argue that we should make it more scholarly. Uh, or, and I don't mean we need to make it more scholarly. I just mean don't undermine the scholarship that's in the program. Uh, you'll, as David just said, you can learn how to write a briefing note when you're in uh, government. But you're never going to learn how to do the analysis on foreign policy when you're in government. Uh, you better come in having studied the literature. Yeah, if I can, if I can just zoom out a little bit, and it, and I think it actually, uh, I think it, f I, I I agree with everything that Mel and Mel and David have said actually, but I wanted to kind of just to zoom out a bit to give you uh, an idea of something that I I found myself thinking about more and more and more now, and it's it's the following: it's that you know we have a at universities we have a remarkable privilege in that we welcome in students for what is at that point in their life a really big portion of the life that they've lived. You know when you're when, you, when you're looking back, when you're 45, 55, 65, and you say, well, there was four years, there was five, six years I spent in university, it wasn't a big slice of your life. But when we take in a student when they're 18 years old for undergrad, through the time when they're, when they're 22, you can do the math, they've spent 20% of their lives with us. It's a huge portion. So a couple of years ago, I was having a conversation with a colleague at a law school, and, and they were saying, you know, they're having a really hard time getting students to speak in seminars. And they were kind of puzzling over this. But if you think about it, those students that were coming in at that point had spent most of their third and fourth year online, mm -hmm. not in a room disagreeing with people, not learning how to present themselves and to put forward an idea, not in the environment that, that they were gonna be then operating in at the law school and, and candidly in firms um, for a certain period of time. And we sort of think, well, this is not a mystery, right? Those students missed two in extremely formative years um, in their education, and it's not that big a share of their, it, it's a huge share of their lives. So th that really impacted me to, and I've always sort of thought of this as I, th as I think Mel and David have, but it really had an impact on me of, of thinking about how we take this very, to us, it's a little short period of time that we have students, but it's actually a hugely consequential time 
in students in students lives and to think about the obligation that we have to to those to those students um, there's a great book Ron Daniels wrote last year uh, you know what do universities owe democracy Carolyn's been engaged on these on these questions there are really serious questions about what our obligations are at a university to prepare young people for citizenship mm -hmm. and to prepare them for the world and if you think that we don't have a moral obligation to these students, I actually think you're in the wrong business. The more time I spend in it, the more I'm convinced that we have a moral obligation to these, to these students. Um, what's that Latin phrase? You know, in, in parentis locus, right? That we're their, we're, we're their parent here in some sense, right? And that's, you might think that's parochial and old fashioned. It, it, it's probably right um, in, some, in some sense. So in the context of a public policy school, what are our obligations? And I think there's different buckets of them. Mel's talked about kind of, you know, he's highlighted the analytical capacities that we want to teach students. Whenever our students ask, why do we have to take microeconomics, it's because I can assure you, you won't do it in the evening in Ottawa when you come home from work, right? <laughs> Even the byword market is more interesting <laughs> than economics, right? Um, you know, we have to teach students how to write and to communicate, right? We have to teach them about the literature and the sets of ideas that they, that they can carry with them into a place, right? Because to David's point, someone's going to go into the Ministry of the Environment, they're going to say there's a whole different way of thinking about this stuff, and they might be the only person who injects that idea um, into the system. We have to give them practical skills. But there's, so there's all this mix of things, and our obligation is to figure out what the, optimal, what the optimal mix is. I'll put one more on the table, which is something that the federal government's very engaged in right now. The clerk has, uh, has uh, renewed uh, a review of kind of the value, as they call it, the values and the ethics of, of, of the public service. This was subject to a report 25 years ago. Yeah, yeah. It's being revisited now. It's a real serious set of questions about what are the values and the ethics that public servants should bring to the table. And by it, there's no question that public servants should be ethical people who are not stealing money and you know running a technology company while they're working for the Ministry of Defense. So some of these things aren't unclear, right? But the questions of what the values are that we should bring to the table the promotion of democracy, fearless, fearless advice, the reconciliation of one's own views with the views of mm -hmm. political masters. These are tough, tough questions. So one thing that we have the opportunity to do at, at Monk, and actually it's, it's an obligation and an opportunity at Massey as well, is the opportunity to try to have students engage in moral reflection mm -hmm. on what kind of person they want to be and how they want to live out their values within a public policy context, and just more broadly um, as students. It's, it's a bit awkward and icky to start talking about morality and ethics and things like that, but we should try to find a way to, to discuss it constructively because like many things, right, when you get out into the real world, you find that life is too busy to actually have a chance to reflect, right? It's, it's hard um, in, the, in, in, in that tumult. So um, those are the stakes for us, right, that we've been given the obligation and the opportunity to work with remarkable students, incredible people, um, for a short time in their life that, that can be highly consequential to them. So we have to get it right or, or you know, the stakes are, the stakes are too high to get it wrong. Well, uh, that's very reassuring to hear from the director of my school. Uh, Mel, did you have a point? Uh, I saw you. Well, I, I, w I was just going to endorse Peter's point, but I, uh, in about uh, five or six years ago, I did a study for the Higher Education Quality Council of Ontario on public policy schools. And at one, I, I met with the directors of all the schools in Ontario, and one of them uh, told me the great thing about coming to our university is you can study public policy and you don't have to take economics. <laughs> uh, and uh, I thought, well, you know, I'm not coming. Uh, <laughs> and, but but the, it's Peter's point. And the other thing, when I then asked them, do you teach uh, anything on values? The answer was no. We only have a one-year program. We don't have the time to do that. And uh, we have professors of philosophy to yes. come in and teach those kinds of courses yes. or law or wherever. And that, that's a really important part of the program. Yeah, that's fantastic. It's um, really reassuring to hear. Um, we have about 18 minutes. I'd like to open the, the panel up to questions from the audience, if anybody has any. I have the microphone. Margie, right behind you. Okay. Um, I, so I will ask the first question. Uh, okay. <laughs> Moderator's uh, <laughs> privilege. <laughs> um, my question is for Professor Lowen. Um, and I really appreciate what you said earlier about how there's a disconnect between um, politicians and their constituents and how they're making decisions based on 
outdated data and you reference the um, uh, census information that is like five years uh, backdated. And I'm curious if you had any opinions about whether there is a role for academics or scholarly research to be more responsive to this kind of information and provide politicians with more up-to-date information on their constituencies composition or their uh, pu pu public opinion in general? Yeah, I mean, I think there is, so yes. So, so, so the short answer is yes, and, and given, given timing what it is, I'll just say one thing, one thing quickly, which is that um, you know, part of the role of universities in this, and universities not as the collection of academics, but universities as, a, as administrative bodies, I think, is to try to shorten the distance as much as possible between what academics are doing and then what's getting into the hands of, of policymakers. So, you know, we do a lot of that at Monk, for example, right? But, but we don't have, in Canada, we don't have what big American publics have. We don't have the tradition of sending big government relation, relations offices to Ottawa. Right, so, so if you're the University of Michigan, you've got a complete unit that works in Washington to basically connect what's going on at the University of Michigan with what's needed in Washington. That's partially about the American ecosystem and, and it's much more permeable in some sense. It's partially about the fact that those universities are in constant lobby mode. But the point is that, that part of that function is they're trying to figure out how to make the University of Michigan uh, act in public service to, to, to the ecosystem in Washington. We don't have a function like that here. Um, and and, and we, we have a government relations office, most universities do, but we're closer to it than other places are. We try and do a good job at Monk, Massey serves that function as well. But that's a, that, that's a, that's a nut to crack, right, is how do, you, how do universities shorten the supply chain, it's essentially of knowledge to, to, the, to policymakers as much as possible. And not leave it to academics to figure this out just for them themselves, right, to try to figure out how to, to navigate the opacity of Ottawa. Uh, thanks for a very uh, interesting uh, panel. Uh, Tom Maxworthy, um, two, uh, two questions. Um, the first is uh, Mel raised the impact of royal commissions as one of the examples of how uh, academics have made a huge influence on Canadian public policy from Raoul Cyril, right, uh, right uh, to uh, the 90s. But the last important Royal Commission we had was on Indigenous Affairs, and, th and that was the mid-90s, really. Uh, so Royal Commissions have gone out of favor because governments can't control the agenda. Uh, a Royal Commission does come up. Macdonald Commission was not appointed to promote free trade. I, I know, we appointed it. <laughs> it came as quite a surprise, Whoops. actually. When, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but, but because they're independent and because research applies and so on, you can't control the agenda. So one of the points is, am I right that they have fallen out of favor precisely of, because of their strengths of independence and academic research? Just point one. And then quickly point two, um, uh, on, on Peter's point about the role of the university and fit for purpose and so on in terms of influencing policy, just two quick comments. First. Sometimes within universities, we do have bodies which have a direct policy influence. Monk has won the most famous in the Citizens Lab. There's no question. Yes. Policies toward China and cybersecurity, that has been the driver more than any other that I know uh, because it was set up with those kinds of purposes within the general academic side. And then related to that, in our mission as academics and policy schools and here at Massey, to provide excellent analysts and excellent academics who go on to do other things. We haven't yet mentioned think tanks, which are set up to be fit for purpose. That's what they're supposed to do. And they're made up of basically academics on contract or full time or NGOs. I mean, more, more of my students now are going into NGOs and think tanks, at least as many as going into government. So I throw those two uh, elements of the analysis. Um, uh, uh, two, two points, uh, a response to two of your points, Tom. The, uh, uh, the first is on royal commissions. We've actually had quite a few royal commissions, but they've all been to solve particular problems, and they've always come back to bite the government, uh, to make your point. And so uh, it's a, a very uh, courageous prime minister, in the yes minister sense, uh, who would appoint another royal commission. Gomery is another classic example. Uh, where looking at the ad, uh, advertising scandal um, where people actually went to jail afterwards, 
um, Martin have to, had to live with the results of the inquiry into Kretya. Um, uh, but uh, the point about think tanks, I think, is huge. Uh, and uh, as a former president of IRPP, um, uh, one of the impediments to academic influence on policy is that the good work that is done for think tanks, and Peter actually contradicted me at the beginning by saying uh, that, that you do take uh, account of this. Uh, most universities do not. And so when I was at IRPP, uh, Kent Roach at the law faculty here and Craig Forsees at the law faculty at U of O told me that their, the peer review process on their IRPP study was much more rigorous than the peer review process in any academic journal they ever have published. Every law journal. <laughs> well, that's the point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that is the point, Peter. Uh, yeah, yeah. And therefore, and, and, but, but when then I would go to talk to Alan Rock, who was president of the University of Ottawa at the time, he said, yeah, we don't give credit for that. I've got to th rethink this. Yeah. Uh, because the quality they were publishing at the, as, uh, the other one was uh, uh, Philippe Lagasse, who now is at Carleton and was at U of O. Um, I got him to do some work on the role of the crown. And he said, I'll get to it eventually. I'm just an assistant professor. I need tenure first. And he knew that the work he was doing for IRPP, even though it was going to be peer-reviewed study, was not going to count for his, in his promotion and tenure committee. And so universities can adapt and make this more open. So can I, I just want to, on, on the Royal it. Commission's thing, Tom, I, I think um, I, I agree with the, what has been said they're too large, they're too unwieldy, and they've become too expensive, right? The last yeah. couple of the, I mean, the aboriginal one, I yeah. forget what the, the cost ended up being, but it was way beyond what anyone had anticipated. But I think um, Peter Nicholson created a sub what's become inside the bureaucracy a substitute for royal commissions, and that's the Council of Canadian Academies and the expert report. So if you look on their website, what you find over the now almost 20 years that it's mm -hmm. been in existence, literally dozens and dozens of very detailed, academically informed reports, you know, run by pan expert panels that inclu usually include a lot of academics, uh, but they're very focused and they're very targeted. They're all based on requests that come from ministries, from federal departments. Um, and they're reviewed, now they're reviewed by the National Science Advisor as well as by the, you know, internal process at CCA and the government's own process. But I think it's substituting in terms of policy research for some of the work that historically was done by royal commissions. Uh, I'm not sure the impact, you know, the, the classic and probably the most influential one is the, is the, is the one on MAID, um, you know, which had a huge, which, which you know, provided the evidentiary base for to, to inform a lot of the public policy decisions around the the introduction of MAID in this country. So, so I think you'll find that uh, and not every one of the expert panels has a direct policy impact, but I think it's it, in, it from my observation point, I think it's substituting a little bit for the role that royal commissions used to play. You've put three coins in the machine for me here, so I'll just I'll just make three really quick points about this. One is, uh, and I'll and the main one is the last one I want to want to talk about, but um, but one is that um, I actually think that the 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 weakness of our think tank ecosystem actually matters in this in this case. Mm -hmm. We have good think tanks, but not enough of them. Um, and I'm not comparing us to the United States. You can compare us to Australia. You can compare us to the United Kingdom, and we don't have the same strength of ecosystem of, of, of think tanks. We also don't have parties that take the policy development process seriously, right? And that's, and that's partially a, an issue of financing. If, you, if you're in Germany, you know, you, you've got these large party um, policy development shops. Yep. You know, the, the, the UK has for a long time set up competing think tanks that are very closely associated with parties. It's not a bad thing. They actually act as idea generators for those parties. But that missing piece, I think, matters a lot um, in our case. I think there's two more things which I think are larger societal trends within Canada. One is that I think we value expertise and intellectualism less in our country than we did, than we did before. Part of this is that we've opened up. Social media does this very well, right? But we've kind of opened up the world to a larger group of people becoming, becoming experts. That's kind of good on balance. 
but it but it doesn't prioritize a specialization of knowledge in some sense. And royal commissions were, were good at that. And the third thing is, and this is this is purely a proposition, but I think we've become very very poor in our country at d discussing and debating moral issues. And made is the made is is the most principal example of this. Our parliament spent more time debating uh, the small business tax changes that Bill Morneau wanted to bring in in 2017, 2018, than it did medical assistance in dying. And it's not an evidentiary question. Now, th there's evidentiary stuff about how you do it, how you set up the policy thing. It's fundamentally a moral question. And you can say there's a moral consensus on it. There is, but still, it's something that you think we would, we would have spent more time in Parliament in. I think that, that there's probably a relationship between our unwillingness to take on deeply moral issues within Parliament and viewing those as off of the off of the agenda, that's that's related to our to our lack of a desire to actually bring debate into the fore on issues and actually for politicians to admit that maybe some of these issues are actually really difficult and they're very complicated and we should instead turn them over to experts and people who are going to deliberate over them and then come back to us um, on those um, on those issues. Thank you. Please Wow, this has been a very exciting morning. Uh, you know, uh, uh, let me say, my name is Wanda. I am a journalist and also a student of peace and conflict studies. Now, coming in uh, from uh, journalism into academia, I can clearly see the disconnect between uh, academia and uh, communication, how we package, how we, we deliver, how we communicate research, to people who don't understand, really they don't have the language, the layman is missing in this whole discourses. We have lofty, great policy papers, great research papers that no one knows anything about other than the academic, um, people in the academic circles. So I think that is something that really has got to be addressed. Uh, now, I love the fact that uh, Pira in particular is speaking about the moral obligation that uh, universities have to make students uh, good citizens. Because I, I, as a student, a parent, and a journalist, again, you see the glaring holes in the, in the discourses that we may have. We want to discuss lofty issues in school, but really not much about how do you make students uh, great citizens. How do you make them critical thinkers when you do not um, encourage critical thought in academia? And I say this with a lot of um, maybe apprehension because I think it's a touchy uh, subject to discuss. When you look at uh, public uh, universities, wh what is going on in the university is all good. We teach research, we teach academia, we teach um, everything on paper. But then when you look at what is happening around us, you ask the question, are we obligated to, to go on with life or oblivious of what is happening in, in, in uh, society? I ask this because as a student of peace and conflict studies, I study theory of peace. I study theories about uh, conflict resolution. And yet, right in our faces, a conflict is raging. And there is um, almost a hush-hush conspiracy to not say a word about what is happening around us, but talk about what is written on paper. So my question to you um, as um, academia is how do we bring together, how do we um, make our relevance felt, and as much as we do research, and then how we communicate and uh, direct public opinion because really we are opinion leaders in our own uh, sectors and uh, places of work, but we cannot go on as if nothing is happening around us. Thank you. I think it's a very it's, look. It's a very it's a very pointed question, and I think you can actually argue it round or you can argue it straight, right? I mean, there's more than one conflict happening in, in the world right now, of course. Um, there's a there was ethnic cleansing that just happened in uh, out of Azerbaijan into Armenia completely. There's, you know, there's terrible things happening in Sudan, across the Sahel, on and on, and, and there's Israel and Gaza, and there's there's all these, and and and, and there are there are two ways of approaching this, and to me this is an open question. It is, do we, is our obligation in our classrooms 
to create a space to understand these issues, to generate mutual understanding, to give people a chance to engage in these issues as dispassionately as possible so that they might appreciate the contours of them and then be willing to take action for them outside of the classroom as effectively as they choose to do? Or is the, is, is the practice in the classroom to invite the conflict in and to have that conflict be something that we, that we try to argue over? And I, and I actually, I don't actually know the answer. I, I know which one is nicer uh, if you're a professor in the, in the, in the classroom. Um, but, but how we're supposed to approach that is actually very, it's a very, very difficult question for us, right? Because as, as, as people running academic units and thinking about this as, as professors, because as much as these issues matter, they should never generate enmity between people in a classroom. They should never be the source of people um, devaluing the dignity of another person in a, in a classroom. But in some ways, the, the conflict, of course, the paradox here is that ignoring these issues and not talking about them can often dehumanize other people by not recognizing that for them the issue is extremely high stakes, it matters for them personally, and to just pretend that it, as though it's not happening and that there aren't real people involved is to, is to not imagine them as, as, real, as real people. So I think that, I mean, that's not, an, that's not a helpful answer perhaps, but, it, but I think it does capture the, the part of the stakes here that our universities if our universities are riven and torn apart by conflicts that are not happening on our campuses, we lose something that's very, very important and very, very special, right? At the same time, if we're sending out into the world students who have no moral engagement, who in their, in, in their, in their kind of vicissitude don't feel uh, moral objection to bad things in the world, then we failed them as, as, um, as citizens, right? If we've so dulled their moral senses, because we've just made them think everything is an intellectual game, then we failed them completely. So there's no easy answer there from my perspective about how we, how we talk about these issues, right? Um, but there are principles that might guide us, right? But boy, in practice, those principles are hard to, are hard to, hard to follow through on. Oh, I. Go ahead. Okay. So, hi. Uh, thank you for this very interesting conversation. Um, it's covered so many topics. I'm trying to wrap my head around it. But I think I'm Allison. I'm a junior fellow at Massey College. And Peter, you said something about the fact that, for better or worse, the politicians are out there at their diners in their constituencies. And what I wanted to know are your thoughts in terms of like, is academic repre representation in public policy representative? of the academy as a whole, or are we in, sort of relying on the input of just, you know, a few universities or institutions or departments? And just all three of your thoughts on that. Thank you. You, you, you both seen it better at the start. Yeah. I, 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 I would uh, make a distinction between academics and uh, the academy. Uh, the institution, uh, when I was high commissioner in the United Kingdom, I had as my third uh, priority um, advancing academic exchange and uh, cultural exchange. And uh, the problem was I thought uh, university to university mattered and it was totally irrelevant. The only university to university that mattered was York University, George, and uh, York University because they had the same name. Uh, <laughs> but that was it, okay? Uh, after that, it was academic to academic, scholar to scholar. And it was researcher to researcher. And uh, so I, I just want to endorse the distinction uh, and recognize that the way to deal with this is by the subject matters that people are working on, uh, which may or may not be uh, institutional or not. Can I just chime in on, on the earlier question? Two, two quick points. One is uh, I, I mentioned the IRPV studies, which are peer reviewed, but there's also the um, uh, policy options, which is a not peer reviewed uh, publication, but uh, the important thing about it is the only people who publish in it are, are published scholars. Uh, and therefore, it, it's not a learned journal, it's a learned magazine, uh, but a valuable contributor to, um, to the policy debate. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mel. Thank you, Peter. We have time for one final question. Please. Fascinating, interesting conversation. Monty McMurchie. And going through my mind is Philippa Foote's trolley problem. Distilled. Because 
ethics, transactional, transformative, the role of the academy, implied or not implied. And then from Ron Daniel's book, atavistically, I sense a fear. And when I emailed him, he responded and said, in today's currency, you are absolutely spot on. There is a fear. It is direct and it is indirect. And speaking truth to power is very, very scary. I will admit, being involved in development, and when I was country director for USAID in Liberia with a budget of $20 million following my UN assignment in Liberia, I encountered the extreme wrath because to do what was right, it meant negating the Beltway bandits because development aid assistance is a business. Business is booming. Business is good. Look at the miasma in Haiti. Look at the amount of billions wasted in DRC. Three trillion dollars actually burned in Afghanistan, Iraq for absolutely nothing. The people that gained were the subcontractors. They made out like gangbusters. And it goes back to Peter Lowen's the idea, what I call the felt moral imperative. It needs to be introduced, but it's also very reprehensible because how does one develop an internal moral governor? You need judgment, experience, and I will admit when I was at U of T, I was enrolled both at the law school and the Toronto School of Theology. So I have a, a background in moral epistemology, allowing one to see outside the skians, to ask the tough questions, and more importantly, to stand firm. The role of judgment. All three of you were very elegant, very erudite, and I am familiar with all three of you. And the issue is, and I put this question to you, and I put it as humbly and as sincerely possible, how can one do least harm by doing the most good? Thank you. Easy question. Yeah, yeah I want to come back. <laughs> I, well, I want to come back to your question, and I want to come back to this one very simply. I've been doing this a long time, uh, probably much too long. Um, and over the years, I've you know, refine what it is we can do and, and what we can't do. And I think, you know, when we're dealing with issues of com conflict, when we're dealing with issues of the, the moral compass, um, I'm trained I, as a political scientist. I've worked my whole life in political science. Um, I think what we can contribute productively is understanding of political, social, economic factors that create the conflicts. And I think uh, part of that understanding is, you know, why do groups on different sides of a conflict feel the, the way they do? Why do they, as Peter said, why do people behave the way they do? Um, and part of th that understanding may be that there is a certain dimension to some conflicts that is also almost unreconcilable. As, as a policy analyst and, you know, as, a, as an internal optimist, when I look at some conflicts, I kind of despair mm -hmm. because I can't see how any of the training I have, any of the insights I can bring, any of the knowledge I have can actually be deployed productively in that conflict. So uh, I, I, then I think our role has to be, you know, you, you, you just have to step back and say, we are not going to be the ones to solve it. And, and what can we do for our students? We can help create a better understanding of the roots of the conflict and why it may appear to be irreconcilable. Uh, I'm also a long believer that history goes in waves. Um, and I think, um, anyway, that, that would be the subject for an entirely different symposium. <laughs> I mean, I just, I just want to say, uh, as uh, as a person who works in a university and as a person who's the, the very proud to be the son of, a, of an Anglican minister, my mom, um, you know, institutions don't last forever. And I think the, the, the Church of England 200 years ago could not imagine how, uh, how in some ways irrelevant it is now compared to what it was then in terms of its influence and its, and its consequence. And we really as universities have to recognize, you know, we're old institutions and we play central roles in our societies. But we have to prove our worth, I think, every day. And I don't think we can presume that we, that we are going to matter or that we have some God-given position uh, of authority, ep epistemological, moral, societal. Uh, uh, we have to, to kind of continually demonstrate our worth to society, not, not only when you're, when you're funded now 20% by the government, 
but 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 when you've placed yourself at the at the center of a real bargain in a society that you should come to these places, get educated, it's going to put you ahead. If that's not true, if what we're selling isn't isn't actually the the, the facts, then it really puts us in an imperiled position. So so I just think that I mean part of what I think this conversation has been really useful for me is thinking about how we articulate what our public role is and, and how we can improve upon it, both at Monk and, and more broadly. Um, so I just want to say that, you know, to, to Monty's point and to the point of some of the other questions, our universities are, are very, very deeply important, but they can't be assumed to be, um, you know, forever institutions that are going to going to thrive, you know? The Anglican Church is going to be here in 100 years, by the way, but, um, <laughs> but it's not going to rule the world. You know? Fantastic. Thank you all for, for participating in the panel today and for lending us your time this, uh, this Friday morning. Um, I know this has been completely riveting for me and also daunting sitting here with uh, the, the intellectual giants to my left. Um, so, uh, <laughs> and of course, Peter, yes. Um, so please, uh, join me in thanking, uh, thanking our panelists. So uh, if you'd like to stay, there will be coffee and refreshments served, and uh, the panel will continue. <laughs>